You can teach me that. It's a All right. Good morning. Glad to have everyone here this morning. We take care of our announcements and our preparations for things going on here locally. And uh, good to have uh, all that are here. We got a good crowd here today. And uh, looking forward to uh, those who will listen later. Uh, open your Bible, if you will. We're going to start in Galatians 1. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. There'll be a couple of other places we'll go. I'm going to make, I'm going to call out references and make references, but we won't have time to go to everything that I'm going to mention. Uh, but we will have a few here at the beginning to lay a foundation, and uh, then we'll hit some high spots and bring it all to a practical application. So we're in Galatians chapter 1. If you found your way there, Galatians 1, I also said 1 Corinthians 15, right? Okay. The Galatians 1, and then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. So Galatians 1, begin at verse 10. We'll read 10, 11, 12. Galatians 1, verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Well, there's a message right there, isn't it? You just stop and ponder that verse for just a minute. You know, so I'm not trying to persuade men or God. If I do I seek to please men. And that's the problem with a lot of churchianity out there today. They're seeking to please men. He says, For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And so as you read and study the life of Paul, and you read what Paul wrote in those 13 epistles he wrote, and you follow his life and the things that Luke recorded in the book of Acts, we know that Paul was not a man pleaser. If he had continued to please men, the priest and the high priest and the Sanhedrin, the elders of Israel, uh, he wouldn't have had any problems. If he just, even, even if he had converted and become like Peter, James, and John, if he had gone that route, he wouldn't have even had as many problems. But yet, Paul says there, if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. He says, verse 11 and 12, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, these passages we're at today, we've been there many times, and it's, it's those things that you just hit all the time and, and get it just drilled in our minds and get us anchored in these things because they're foundational things that affect so many other things about which we believe. And so Paul says again, verse 11, I certify you. He gives a certif certificate of authenticity, so to speak. It's a guarantee. <coughs> He says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. So he's making a reference there to the gospel that he preached. The gospel that was preached of me is not after man. So Paul's gospel is not after man. He goes on and says, verse 12, For I neither received it of man, no man gave me the gospel that I preach." He says, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. Whatever gospel was being preached before I got the gospel that I received, that I certify, he said, whatever that gospel was, whoever preached that gospel, he said, I didn't get the gospel that I preached, my gospel, the gospel that's preached to me. He says, I'm certifying to you, I'm guaranteeing you that I didn't get that gospel from any man and I was not taught that gospel by any man. Well, now, that shouldn't be hard for us to understand at all. I mean, were there folks preaching a gospel before Paul ever showed up on the scene? Yes. But is, Paul de is Paul's declaration here saying that the gospel he preached, he didn't learn from any of those guys? Paul didn't learn his gospel from Peter or James or John. Paul didn't learn his gospel from those folks that were preaching a gospel, and I say it like that because it was a different gospel than what Paul preached. So he says, I certify you, brethren, the gospel which is preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
So it's the revelation of Christ. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ in his heavenly position, seated at the right hand of the Father, as he spoke and gave revelations to our apostle Paul, and Paul talks about that, Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26, as Paul went about his ministry and he received <coughs> revelations, progressive revelation over the course of his ministry, it was the Lord Jesus Christ, the ascended Lord Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, who spoke to and gave to Paul the revelations that he wrote down and that we have preserved for us today in our Bible. Amen? Amen. So he says it's by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I didn't get the gospel that I preached from any man. I didn't get it from Peter, James, or John. The ascended Lord Jesus Christ gave me that gospel. That's important. And we have to get that nailed down in our heart and mind. So that when we hear other things going on out there in churchianity, we have discernment to go back to this verse to kind of identify well, what gospel are they preach and what's their authority and where are they coming from with all that. Amen? Now, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Then 14, that year, we're still in Galatians, excuse me. Uh, then 14 years after, I went up and began to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation. Well, once again, what's that mean? It means it was revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ to go. I went up by revelation. The ascended Lord Jesus Christ told me to go. And he says, when he got there, he says, and communicated unto them. And I always, pay, I always slow down, pay attention to these next few words. Paul says that he was went up by revelation. It was revealed to him by the ascended Lord Jesus Christ that he needed to go up to Jerusalem. He went up there and he communicated unto them. In other words, he gave to them. He spoke to them. He expressed to them. He communicated unto them. Notice those next words. That gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Now, do you think that might be important? It's real important. He says, I went up to Jerusalem to communicate to them, and because Jesus told me it was time to go, and I communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Well, that's the same gospel he's talking about there in verse 10, 11, and 12, that if he yet pleased me, and he wouldn't be the servant of God. That's that gospel that he certified, that the gospel that was preached to him, he got by revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he goes up to share with them, to give them, to communicate with them, that gospel which he preaches among, which he preached among the Gentiles. And so there's, a, there's, there's an implication there, then, that that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles is different than that gospel that James, Peter, and John were preaching. Otherwise, why would he have to go up there and explain something? You know, you just send a note. Hey guys, I'm preaching the same thing you are. But he says, he went up to communicate that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. Now drop in at verse 7. Now, without taking time to read all through the narrative, those of that are around, we've been here many times. So we get just down to verse 7 for the point of our message, the direction we're going to do. <coughs> Paul says, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So I'm going to stop right there. I'm showing you that we're talking about this gospel. Well, what was the gospel that was given to Paul? What was this gospel that was given to him by revelation? What was this gospel that he talks about, the gospel which was preached of me? What is that gospel? It was that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. Well, he gives it a name right there. He calls it the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to Paul. And by this time, the gospel of the uncircumcision didn't just have to do with the Gentiles uncircumcised, but it also had to do with those Jews in those synagogues who were uncircumcised in heart and mind and ears. That Stephen put that thing on there in Acts 7.51. 
So this idea of being uncircumcised. So we're talking about the gospel and the gospel of the uncircumcision. We're talking about that gospel which Paul preached. Now go with me to 1 Corinthians 15. Back to your left. 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul talks about the gospel which was preached of him. He talks about that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. He talks about the gospel of the uncircumcision. So what is the content of that gospel? What is that gospel? It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And so we'll read there for a few minutes. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, More brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. He's making a declaration. Just like he had a certification back there in Galatians 1.11, here he's saying, okay, I'm declaring that certified gospel that I received of the, by revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So he preached it, they received it, and they stood in it. Verse 2, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. And I always have to mention this because I don't know who clicked on it the last time I said it, so I'm going to say it again in case, oh, I got it this time. Because people get tripped up right there. He says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, and people want to make that a conditional thing. But it's not a conditional kind of thing there. If you keep in memory, Paul's just saying, as he's writing the letter, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached, which you receive, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. In other words, look guys, I was there in Corinth. I preached to you for a period of time. You know what I preached. If you'll remember what I preached to you. Everybody there? That's what that phrase is talking about. It's not putting a conditional situation on salvation. It's just Paul calling to their recollection what he had preached to them when they were there. The gospel that he preached, the gospel that he received, the gospel he preached to them, the gospel that they received, the gospel wherein they stand. And then he goes on and says, unless you have believed in vain. People get all bothered about that phrase. But if you keep reading through 1 Corinthians 15, the whole content of the chapter is, if, is about the resurrection of Christ. And he says, we're not taking the time to go there, but if you keep reading through 1 Corinthians 15 there, it's not very far down the trail where he makes it clear. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then your faith is vain and our preaching is vain. So the idea there, unless you believed in vain, has to do with, huh, hey folks, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, you, there's, you believed in vain. And he explains that as you keep reading 1 Corinthians 15. That's why I always emphasize when you give the gospel, it's not just about the death of Christ on the cross for our sins, but it's his burial and his resurrection for our, for our justification. If you keep Jesus hanging up there on that cross, there's no salvation in the bloody sacrifice of Christ for our sins if there's no resurrection. Have to have the resurrection to have a gospel and for us to have salvation. The death of Christ paid our sin debt. The resurrection of Christ proves that the Father was satisfied with the sacrifice of His Son, that the dead is paid, and He was raised, and when we place our faith and trust, and that He died on that cross for our sins, was buried, was raised again for our justification, when we place our faith in what Christ did on our behalf, we are saved, and it's only possible because of the whole package. Everybody there? So that's what he's talking about, unless you believe in vain. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So what gospel was Paul saved under? Same gospel he's fixing to give them, right? He says, for I delivered unto you. He says, I'm going to declare it. Y'all remember. Here it is. He says, this is what I delivered to you. 
This is the thing I preach to you. This is the thing you receive. This is the thing where you stand. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Same gospel that will save you is the same gospel that saved Paul. There's his testimony of it right there. He goes on and says, How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now the death of Christ was prophesied in the Scriptures. His burial was prophesied in the Scriptures. His resurrection was prophesied in the Scriptures. And so Paul, as he was able to go about, especially in that early part of his ministry, when he was going to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Paul could take the Scriptures and show them that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the promised prophesied Christ, the Messiah, with all those promises made to Israel. And then he could go on to say that he was crucified, he was killed, just like the Old Testament prophet said he would be, and he was buried, and he came out of the grave just like the Old Testament prophet said he would. Now the real key there is those two little words, how that. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Because the idea of all the Old Testament, you've heard me say this before, and I hit this nail again, the idea of all the Old Testament had to do with the promises and the prophecies made to Israel. And as Israel responded to that, if they would believe on that, then they then, as they rose to their place where they're supposed to be out there, and they will be one day in the future, as they rose to that place, responded in faith and obedience to what God gave them, then they would take a message then to the Gentiles. Okay? Now, even with all that being said, we've talked about this before. When Jesus told the apostles in his earthly ministry that he was going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified and slain, what did they say every time? Well, they said, don't go, but they said, we're not going to let it happen. Did they have any understanding of the death of Christ and what he was going to do? They had none. Even when it comes to his resurrection, did he not tell them he was going to come back and all that? And so, But were they hanging out at the tomb? No, they weren't. Matter of fact, when, when the women came back and told them, they were in disbelief. How that? Go with me to uh, 2 Corinthians 5, Paul, right there. Turn to your right few more pages. What's the how that? I think the how that spelled out for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at the beginning of verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Let me stop right there for just a minute. When you read the prophecies through the Old Testament and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you read these references to the death of Christ, it always makes a statement about he died for many. It doesn't say he died for all. See, he was going to die for many. It doesn't say he was going to die for all. But now we get here and Paul says that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all. Paul tells us that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. That's good news. Because that includes us. Verse 16. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. So Paul's saying very clearly right there at verse 16 that we have known Christ after the flesh. Well, that's a reference to Christ in his earthly ministry to Israel. He says, we have known Christ after the flesh. He goes on to say, but, hence, uh, uh, but yet now henceforth know we him no more. Father, we, folks, we don't follow the earthly ministry of Christ to Israel. We have known Christ after the flesh. 
Paul's able to write that to the Corinthians for folks who maybe have seen, maybe heard Jesus in that time. So he says, we have known Christ after the flesh, but now henceforth know we him no more. Not about his earthly ministry now. Now it's about his heavenly ministry. He gave to Paul. Verse 17, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I don't care what you've heard preached all your whole life. Verse 17 has nothing to do with your nasty flesh. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. That inner man was dead and is now alive. Amen? He's a new creature. <clears throat> Something brand new going on. It's not a cleaning up of the old flesh. It's a transformation of the inner man from death into life, from being in Adam to being in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. That's the, the spiritual man. Verse 18, And all things are God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Who did the reconciling? God did. How did he do it? By Jesus Christ. And hath given to us, the end of verse 18, the ministry of reconciliation. So he's reconciled us to himself by the work of Christ, and then he gives to us then the ministry of reconciliation. And he will talk about that as we carry on. He goes on, verse 19, to admit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Again, who reconciled the world unto himself? God did. How did he do it? In Christ. Christ did the reconciling. God did the reconciling through his son, Jesus Christ. He goes on and explains what he's talking about, verse 19. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. <coughs> we talk about the imputed righteousness of Christ that we receive, the moment of salvation. Right? But here he's talking about our sin debt being imputed to Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Your trespasses aren't imputed or credited to your account. And I mean before you were saved or after you were saved. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ went to that cross, died that bloody death, and in Christ, God the Father reconciled the world unto himself and now, at that point, is not imputing their trespasses unto them. Why? Because he imputed them all to Christ. When we say Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and we say how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that's what this is talking about. How did that happen? God the Father placed all of our sins on God the Son. It satisfied his righteous judgment and now, and all of our sin was imputed to him, and he goes on then to say, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. He's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then, we, as we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And so we've talked about that many times. Reconciliation is a two-part thing. So God was reconciled to us, to mankind, by the work of the cross. And then he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. And we go to others and say, God's been reconciled to you. Now you can be reconciled to God. Therein is the gospel transition the thing that takes place. And so we beseech you in Christ's stead. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be you reconciled to God. Verse 21. Here's the how that. Verse 21. The how that of 1 Corinthians 15. Here's the how that. For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, 
to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that might there is not a maybe so kind of thing, but it's a power kind of thing. That we might, that we would have the power to be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus did it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain and he washed it white as snow. The gospel, folks, is the most important thing. We can disagree with people and people can disagree with us on lots of things. But we've got to be settled, we've got to be anchored, we've got to be established in the gospel. I said, well, Sam, you preach that to us all the time. I know. But I do that for a reason. I haven't given it yet, but the, the title of the message is Everything That Calls Itself Christian Is Not Christian. And that's a hard thing for us to swallow sometimes. Because we look around, we see these good, godly Jesus talking, Bible toting, church going folks, good neighbors, wholesome people. We have conversations. They talk about Jesus, we talk about Jesus. They talk about the Bible, we talk about the Bible. They go to church, we go to church. They sing songs, we sing songs. And so we automatically make that all. Oh, they must be good, godly Christian people. Well, wait a minute. They don't have the gospel right. Are they good, God? Excuse me. Are they good, godly Christian people? The answer to that is no. If they got the gospel wrong, they're not good, godly Christian people. Matter of fact, just the opposite. They're tools of Satan because they masquerade and people listen to them and are, if they don't have the right gospel, if they've not trusted the right gospel, can they give the right gospel to a lost person that they're influencing? The answer to that, no. Can they bring that lost person into their religion? Yeah, they can do that. But in my mind, if you take someone that's completely unchurched, completely, you know, what we would call heathen or pagan or, you know, whatever kind of thing you want to talk about, and you bring them in, you clean up their life, they, they start doing better, behaving better, becoming better citizens, and, you know, better uh, uh, members of society, and they get all involved in that, and, but they're still lost and on the way to hell, what have we done? We've made them twofold children of hell. Because before that person got a hold of them, they may have known they were lost. They may have known they were out of the way. They were, may have known that they were away from God. But then this religious person with a false gospel gets a hold of them, brings them in, and now because of the deceit of Satan and religion, they have been brought in. They now think that they're on their way, or at least they're working hard to get there. Now you tell me if that's of God or if that's of the devil. That's of the devil. Ninety-eight times the word gospel, or I should say ninety-eight verses in our New Testament, the word gospel is used. Seventy-three times by Paul. Four times a reference in Acts, sixty-nine times in his epistles. I won't take time to go there, but... Uh, as I'm looking at my notes here, uh, Paul uses the expression, my gospel, three times. Romans 2.16, Romans 16.25, 2 Timothy 2.8. He clearly says those two words together. This is my gospel. When he says it's my gospel, that's a reference back there even to 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, Galatians 1 and 11. That gospel, which, or excuse me, That'd be two verse two, two verse one or two. That gospel I preach among the Gentiles, Galatians one eleven. It's the gospel which was preached of Him, which is not after man. That's Paul's gospel. He calls it my gospel, three different times. 
lots of references as you read through Paul's letters about the gospel. He calls it the gospel. He references the gospel of God six times, the gospel of the Son one time, the gospel of Christ 11 times, the gospel of peace twice, the gospel of the uncircumcision one time, the gospel of your salvation one time, the glorious gospel of the blessed God one time, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ one time, and the gospel of the grace of God one time. A lot of references to the gospel. When we look at references regarding the death, burial, and resurrection, we're talking about Jesus rose again, or he was risen from the grave, or he was raised from the dead. we got a total of 26 times that Paul makes reference to those things, at least 26 times. If you dig a little deeper and say, well, you know, that's a reference, this is a reference, but 26 clear times there's a reference to the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, the gospel. In references about the gospel, and I'm going to just kind of rattle through this list as you listen in. Paul said he was not ashamed of the gospel. He talks about the blessing of the gospel, a dispensation of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, the preparation of the gospel, the mystery of the gospel, the defense and confirmation of the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel, the defense of the gospel, the faith of the gospel, the beginning of the gospel, the hope of the gospel, the afflictions of the gospel, the bonds of the gospel. Paul says he was separated unto the gospel. He was ministering the gospel. He says to those believers who came to faith through his ministry, he said, I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul talks about the power in the gospel and praise is in the gospel and subjection unto the gospel. And there are those who pervert the gospel. And there's partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. There's the fellowship in the gospel. That our conversation be as it becometh the gospel. That women which labored with him in the gospel. Put in trust. He was put in trust with the gospel. He talks about those who were fellow laborers in the gospel. He talks about them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. He talks about how, it was, how the gospel abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Brother Sam, we got the gospel. <laughs> it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then we're going to step back and say, well, doesn't every church in town preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Yeah. I mean, we got Resurrection Sunday coming up, Easter Sunday coming up in just a few weeks. And as I always mention on that particular day, every church in town is talking about the resurrection of Christ. But the issue is whether or not they're preaching the gospel clearly and plainly like Paul preached it to us is, what are they telling you you have to do to get access to that gospel? See, there's the secret. How do I get out? I know Jesus died. I know he's buried. I know he's raised again. Well, how do I get access to what he did? And what they tell you then is the key to whether they're preaching the gospel that saves or if they're preaching a perverted gospel. I mean, the devil would be foolish to just take all that out, wouldn't he? I mean, that's how deceit works. You've got to give enough of the truth to bait. But there's a hook in it. Paul says that we're, we're saved, we receive the gospel, we do it by faith. 17 times I've got marked here. He says it's by faith 17 times, it's by grace 5 times, it's through faith 7 times. Paul says it's not of works 12 times. That's important too. It's by faith, it's by grace, it's through faith. It's not of works. We're going to add, talk about that as we continue on. Twelve times, a direct reference, not of works. Eighty-seven times, Paul talks about believing the gospel or belief in the gospel. Eighty-seven times. And I've got it written out how many times in each book, and I won't take the time to give that. Eighty-seven times, Paul makes reference to believe or belief as it relates to the gospel. So we are to believe the gospel. We trust, we believe the gospel. He says trust. 
He uses the word trust in relation to the gospel. We believe the gospel. 87 times he makes reference to it. He says we trust the gospel. 10 times he makes reference to that. So that we know then that salvation is by grace, through faith, by faith, in believing the gospel and trusting the gospel. Everybody with me? It's pretty simple. Paul uses the, definite, the, the expression salvation or saved in relationship to those who in relation to those who trusted the gospel. He uses that expression 43 times. Salvation or saved. 43 times. And then he talks about how he put the gospel out. He said he preached it. We're preaching the gospel today. When you sit down with your neighbor and you have a conversation and you share the gospel, what are you doing? You're preaching, preaching the gospel. You may not be standing up behind the saddle pulpit. <laughs> you may not be standing up at your bar hitting the bar top. You know. You may be riding down the road in the car. You may be walk, riding side by side down the trail. You may be sitting across a meal table. But you share with them the gospel. That's preaching the gospel. 69 times Paul makes a reference to preaching the gospel. You see how quickly I'm turning these pages? Mm -hmm. <laughs> really tempted to slow down and start reading some of these verses, but again, I'm just going to hit them. If your mind's working, I hope it is, <laughs> then eventually your mind is going to get to this place. But Brother Sam, if I make a bold public stand regarding the gospel, I might lose friends. If I talk to my good, Bible-toting, church-going, clean-living friend about the gospel and I make some insinuation like, you need to hear this because you're probably lost, right? That's going to cost me. But wait a minute, didn't he tell us he's committed to us the word of reconciliation? He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation? Did he say that he's left us here as his ambassadors and we're to plead with others? Be ye reconciled to God? Don't we know the only way, the, the how that of being reconciled is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself? For he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, and that's simply by faith. We hit it all the time, Romans 4, uh, Romans 4, 4, 25, 26, with Romans 5, 1, says he was delivered for our offenses, he was raised again for our justification, therefore being justified by faith, period, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the next thing here is I'm going through this about all that we know about the gospel and how it's presented and how it's received. Then we know as we do that, there's going to be persecution and affliction associated with those who give the gospel. Did not Paul go through persecution and affliction? Mm -hmm. And did he not warn us? Thirteen times Paul makes a reference to persecution for giving the gospel. Ten, uh, ten times he makes a reference to the affliction of the gospel. So that's 23 times. If we give the gospel, there's going to be a price. It's going to cost us. <clears throat> now go with me to back to Galatians. Back to Galatians. We're going to be in Galatians and 2 Corinthians as we finish this. Galatians. Again, verse 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1.
Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. This is Paul's first letter. As you know, following Paul's ministry, he had to constantly affirm his apostleship. So he says he's an apostle not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and by God the Father who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 2, And all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia, grace be to you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who, raised him, who gave himself for our sins. See, there, there's one of those little subtle references. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. <clears throat> so there's somebody out there coming into that region of Galatia and was causing those folks to be moved away from Paul who preached to them the gospel of Christ. And Paul says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and then he goes on to say, unto another gospel. Verse 7. Which is not another. But there will be some that trouble you. And I got news for you, folks. Listen to me. If somebody is coming and preaching another gospel, that's troublesome. There's, there are folks... Let me see if I can bring it in with this thought. A little answer a question that may come up in your mind a little bit down the road. There are folks who heard the gospel, who trusted the gospel, who believed on Christ and what he did alone for their salvation. And the moment they did that, the moment they trusted the finished work of Christ, they're saved by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. But then, somebody comes knocking on their door, and they've got some literature for you, and they get you to read that literature. They're really nice, they're dressed nice, they're very sweet, they come in and sit in your living room, can we come back again? Oh yeah, sure, we'll have coffee and donuts, they come back again. And again, this can happen anywhere in life. It can happen at the front door. It can, it can happen talking to somebody riding down the trail. And they start preaching another gospel. <clears throat> now again, was there a time and a place where you trusted Christ alone? Yeah. Are you saved and sealed for all eternity? Yes. But when they come along and they start giving you stuff, if you're not anchored in the book and you're not settled on this is the gospel, do you think they might control your mind and lead you astray? Because they sound real good. So that's why he says, but though he says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would well, people don't like it when you use that word. Pervert. Would pervert the gospel of Christ. Y'all know what perversion is. I mean, when we think of perversion, we don't think of the gospel, do we? You know what we, you know what we think of when we, when we hear the word pervert or perversion. You say, that dude's a pervert. <laughs> well, here Paul says is, these folks who come in and trouble them pervert the gospel of Christ. Strong word. Paul wrote it by inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He goes on to say, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, remember 1 Corinthians 15? I preached it. You received it, and you stand in it, right? 
Paul said, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be a curse. Let him be cut off. Send him the way. Don't give him the time of day. Don't say, God bless you. Well, that's pretty important, isn't it? Somebody comes knocking on their door or somebody's riding down the trail and they start presenting to you a false, perverted gospel. Should you say, in the spirit of peace, well, God bless you. We'll just have to agree to disagree. You say, look, I love you, but you're preaching a perverted gospel. Now, you can sugarcoat that, put as much peanut butter around it if you want, that you want to, to help them swallow that pill. But, but, but folks, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation of ambassadors of Christ. And there is nothing more important than the gospel because it's the gospel that saves folks from an eternal hell and separation from God. We have to be established in that thing. And we have to know when these folks are coming along preaching this other stuff that will take away from the gospel, they're perverting that gospel. That ought to bother us. I don't care how sweet they are. I don't know how nice they look. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to go ahead and tell you we're not going to be through all that. They should have figured that out. Second Corinthians chapter 4. We won't be here next week, so we're going to get a little bit of next week in this week. Alright. You got to go, go. I'm going to finish. Stay with me. I said second Corinthians, and here I am in first. Don't have time for that, son. Well, that's in bad. I start reading, I'll be scratching my head saying, oh, man. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, finally. 2 Corinthians 4. Again, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. What ministry do we have? Ministry of reconciliation. Right? Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. As we have received mercy, we faint not. but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. When you pervert the gospel of Christ, is that dishonesty? But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. When you talk about the death, burial, and, and I shouldn't say you, when they talk about the death, burial, and resurrection, but then they pervert the gospel, is that being crafty? Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Again, is that what they do? But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse three. Well, folks, I want y'all. I want y'all. I want y'all to be really familiar with Second Corinthians chapter four. You struggle with some of this we're talking about today as you deal with others out here in the community. You get real familiar with Galatians 1 and 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, who's it hidden to? Them that are lost. If our gospel be hid, it's hidden to them that are lost. Verse 4. In whom the God, little g, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. Who is it that blinds them? The God of this world, Satan himself, that old serpent, that old beguiler, that old deceiver. And can he use religion and good, clean, quote unquote, God fearing people to do it? Absolutely. And whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glory of God's glorious gospel of Christ should shine into, should, who is the image of God should shine unto them. Verse 5, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. 
And that comes, it's not about us. It's not about being right. It's not Sam, you, you know, I get people on there. Sam, you think you're the only one who's right. How can you say all these other people are wrong? It ain't about me. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. Again, that ties us back there to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, I pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's the idea there. He says, ourselves your service for Jesus' sake. He's not here to talk to you, but I am. And here's what he's told us to tell you. Verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness... Way back there in Genesis 1, let there be light, right? For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Verse 8, we're troubled on every side. Yet not distressed. Remember we talked about there's afflictions, there's persecutions. When you become adamant and bold in your expression of the gospel and you do not tolerate the perversion of the gospel because you know it comes from the God of this world who blinds the minds of them that believe not. When you do that, verse 8, we're troubled on every side. <coughs> yet not distressed. We are perplexed. You ever try to have a conversation with some of these good, godly church going, Jesus talking, him singing folks, and they, they come out so strongly against the words you're trying to give them and come out so strongly that's who you are and what you're trying to do, and it makes you just kind of go, I don't understand that. Perplexed. Verse 9, persecuted, uh, perplexed, but not in despair. Verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. We have in the same, verse 13, verse 12. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have we have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. Ye also believe, and therefore speak. I believe that the Paul's gospel is the only gospel that saves today. I believe that the devil would pervert the gospel of Christ. I believe the devil would come in there and preach a, another gospel. I believe and therefore have I spoken. We are, it says, yeah, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Verse 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. <coughs> For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many around, abound, redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, that's what Paul calls that. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, and that's in the eternal perspective of things. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far, far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, go with me to chapter 11. Hang with me. Chapter 11. Some of you don't want to see us going here. First, first, second Corinthians 11 in verse 1 
Would to God ye can bear with me a little of my folly and indeed bear with me. You understand what he's saying right there? <clears throat> Tolerate me. Put up with me. Right? We may express that. Well, I can, I can, I, I can. <coughs> it's hard for me to bear this cold. It's cold this morning. I mean, when here it is the middle of March, pushing toward the end of March, <coughs> and we wake up and it's like 19 degrees or something, and there's spitting snow, none of us like that. None of us have any sense like that. <laughs> 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 but, we, but we bear with it. And we bear with it because we know it's going to be 70 by the end of the week. And as Linda said, today's the last day of winter. Makes tomorrow the first day of spring. But we bear with things. It has the idea of putting up with things, tolerating things. So Paul says, Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. Verse 2, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Verse 3, he says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, y'all with me? As Paul says, I fear lest by any means, any means, good, godly, church going, Bible toting, hymn singing, right? Lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be complete, corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if he receive another spirit, which he have not received, that's a little less. That's the spirit of that one coming in and preaching to you. If you receive another spirit, which he have not received, or another gospel, which he have not accepted, ye might bear with him. You see Paul's concern there? He says, I fear that you might bear with, put up with, that you might tolerate this one who comes in preaching another God, Jesus, having another spirit, and preaching another gospel. Paul says, I fear that you might bear with that one, and in so doing, as the serpent beguiled Eve, you might be beguiled from the simplicity of Christ. You see Paul's concern? I've got the same concern. Verse 5, Paul says, For I suppose that I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, I guess I'm guilty of that sometimes. <laughs> but we... But we have been th truly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. Paul talking about he, he accepted the financial care of others so that he could minister when he was there in heart. Go on. Verse 9. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that what I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory they may be found, even as we. Verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. He's talking about those that you might bear with. He's talking about those up there, verse 3 and 4. Those that would preach another Jesus. Those that would come in with another spirit. Those that would preach another gospel. Those that would use the subtlety of Satan to deceive somebody, to beguile somebody from the simplicity that's in Christ. 
He said, these folks, verse 13, are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. Paul said in Galatians 1, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the gospel of Christ. Paul says, I can't believe this. I'm flabbergasted as he writes to those Galatians about them being accepting somebody coming in, preaching another gospel. But here he says, it's no marvel. He was marveled that they could be brought away. But here he says, verse 14, and it's no marvel that these apostle apostles, deceitful workers, these folks who are transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, it's no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Read that again. Satan himself is transformed into an angel, angel of what? Light. Light. The God of this world that blinded their minds lest they should hmm. believe and receive the light of the gospel. But here it is, he transformed himself into an angel of light. He said, I'm representing God. Verse 15, therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends should be according to their works. Folks, is it important to get the gospel right? Is it important that we know and that we <coughs> ourselves have trusted Christ? as presented by the gospel. That we're able to in our own heart and mind to <coughs> examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. <coughs> there was a day and a time and a place where I realized I was a sinner and I couldn't save myself. And apart from any religious activity, I simply, in my own way, heart and mind, I realized I couldn't save myself and I trusted Christ in what he did for my salvation. That's it. Amen. And if you stand fast in that gospel, if you understand that gospel is the gospel that saves, and it's the only gospel that saves, and if you go about the ministry of reconciliation and you tell others that's the only gospel that saves, and you're very attentive and discerning as you listen to folks. Because remember what we said? Every church that calls itself a church is talking about the death, burial, and resurrection. The secret is whether they're preaching the gospel is how do you get access to that? Well, that is my last page. Close the clock. I got right there. I closed it, but I still made records. Now, I know I'm late. I'll get fussed out about this one. That's all right. I may come along and say, <clears throat> you've heard me say it, said it here, I've done it publicly out there. And I said, that, and, I, and I preached along these lines before. I think last time you, Kevin and Gina were here, I preached because I was talking about the Asbury Revival. But folk, if, if the gospel is so clear, so precise, Really so simple. But the gospel can be perverted. Then when you hear me say something like any religious thing out there that is acceptable by the Catholics, the Mormons, the Pentecostals, the Church of Christ, all these religious folks like it and defend it <laughs> and get mad at me when I say something against it, why would I say that? Because there's not enough gospel there. If there's not enough gospel there to offend a Mormon, it ain't worth while. If there's not enough gospel there to offend a Catholic, it ain't worth while. If there's not enough gospel there to offend a Pentecostal, it ain't worth while. If there's not enough gospel there to offend the church of Christ, it ain't worthwhile. Because all those folks preach a 
a perverted gospel. See, that's where I get in trouble. I can say everything I said right up to that point, but when I say those folks, and I've made illusions, I've talked about good people, go to church and, you know, talk about Jesus, well, that's all fine. But when you start naming names of religious organizations, then folks get all up in arms. Well, well, Sam, who are you to speak ill of our Christian brothers and sisters? They're not our Christian brothers and sisters. If they're trusting and believing the gospel that that organization they're a part of is preaching and teaching. Now again, could someone have been saved by grace through faith and finished work of Christ and because of their ignorance of the word of God, somebody come knocking on their door and draw them into that thing? Yeah, absolutely. But they weren't saved then by that organization's doctrine. They were sucked into that organization's doctrine. And here's the tough part. If they get sucked into that and then they start espousing that organization's doctrine, what are they doing as they reach out to others? They're preaching a false gospel now. They might be saved, but they're preaching a false gospel. This is from a Catholic church website. A Catholic website. Pay attention to the words. The Catholic church does not now, nor has it ever taught, a doctrine of salvation by works. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? But keep listening. That we can work our way into heaven. Additionally, nowhere in the Bible does it says, say that we are saved by faith alone. The only place in all of Scripture where the phrase faith alone appears is in James 2.24. Now, how many times have you heard me say every error in doctrine, every error in doctrine comes by a failure to rightly divide the word of truth, right? Who does James write to? He tells us in chapter 1, verse 1. James, to the twelve tribes of Israel, scattered and raw. James is not right to you, but the Catholic Church is going to quote that here. So it says, uh, the only place in all of Scripture where a phrase faith alone appears is in James 2.24, where it says that we are not justified or saved by faith alone. The Bible says very clearly that we are not saved by faith alone. Works do have something to do with our salvation. Is that the gospel of Christ? Is that the gospel Paul preached? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I remember right, I think I had 12 references where Paul said, not of works. So this official statement, works do have something to do with our salvation. Numerous passages in the New Testament that I know of about judgment says we'll be judged by our words or by, not by whether or not we have faith alone. And he gives references here. <clears throat> if we are saved by faith alone, uh, why does 1 Corinthians 13, 13 say that love is greater than faith? Again, perverting, twisting. Shouldn't it be the other way around? As Catholics, we believe that we are saved by God's grace alone. We can do nothing apart from God's grace to receive the free gift of salvation. Now, as I read other places, when the Catholic says we're saved by grace alone, when the Catholic says that, you receive grace when you get into the Catholic Church. You're saved by grace alone. If you put up, you, you can go into a Catholic Church and you can put grace equals Catholicism. And they'd say, that's right. Mm -hmm. You get into grace, that means you've gotten into the church. That's what they mean when they say that. We can do nothing apart from God's grace. Can't do anything apart from the church. Their church. To receive the free gift of salvation. We also believe, however, that we have to respond to God's grace. Oh, see, here, here's the hook. Protestants believe that too. However, many Protestants believe that the only response necessary is an act of faith, whereas Catholics believe a response of faith and works is necessary.
Do the Catholics believe you're, do the Catholics, do the Catholics teach death, burial, and resurrection? Yeah. But they tell you that it's by faith and works. Do they use the word grace? But do they mean by grace what Paul meant by grace? No. See how easy we can look at that and say, if we don't pay attention, you know, that, oh man, they've got that little different doctrine, but they're, no, they're not. All these groups I've talked about, they all believe that salvation comes through membership, water baptism, and living right. They all preach and teach to some degree or another that you've got to get wet, some man or another, you've got to get wet. And, and yeah, you got to believe in Jesus, but, it, but as I read through it, I'm not going to take the time to read through all this stuff I've got, but as you believe in Jesus, it's like I saw a t-shirt hanging in a western store one time. It said, do your best, let God do the rest. Do you understand that's the perverted gospel that's out there? You do your best, and what you can't get done for yourself, the grace of God will take up your slack. Now you tell me, does that salvation depend upon you or Jesus alone? That salvation depends upon you. These folks are out here get mad at me, get mad at others, get mad at you. <laughs> if you make a clear presentation of the gospel and if you have refused to accept the perverted version that's out there. A couple more comments and I'm going to be done. This new movie, Jesus Revolution, see, it's one of those things I get myself in trouble about. <laughs> this guy, Lonnie Frisbee, who is the hippie character, the hippie man of the Jesus Revolution, big thing in the 70s. I did some research on him. Here's his salvation testimony. He was high on LSD. You don't have to raise your hands, but if, if we did, I would raise mine. <laughs> I've been high on LSD more than once. Part of my hoodlum youth. He said, so, so you know, again, I, I identify with what he's saying. But he says, he was high on LSD, read the book of John, and got saved while high on LSD, reading the book of John. Now, folks, there is not... Well, number one, the gospel of our salvation is not found in the book of John. Nowhere. It's not there. You won't find the gospel of our salvation, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, preached anywhere. <coughs> you won't find Paul's gospel preached anywhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But he says he was high on LSD, read the book of John... And got saved. <coughs> and then he got involved. Well, if you watched the movie, if you saw the movie, but I mean, this guy became quote unquote a great evangelist. He was a homosexual. Continued to practice homosexual activity. He was a druggie. Continued to practice drug activity. And I don't mean just you know had a struggle with it. I mean he just continued to embrace it. And the guy died of AIDS. That's the great guy that the Jesus Revolution is all about. And then these preachers embraced him. And he preached at all the big name churches around the country. And it was, said, it, it was, it was written in his own testimony, his own words, the stuff he did. He would get high and party and be with men and do that kind of stuff all night long on a Saturday night and then go preach for Shuler at the Crystal Cathedral in California Sunday morning. Or Calvary Chapel on Sunday morning. Or wherever else. Now, y'all tell me. I don't sit there. This guy, Jonathan Romy, y'all know who he is. He plays Jesus on The Chosen. He had played Lonnie Frisbee in the movie Jesus Revelation. He's a devout Catholic, 
a part of the Knights Templar. You go study about the Knights Templar in modern day time. This Jonathan Roney went to Lonnie Frisbee's grave. Lonnie Frisbee is buried in what was, was it uh, Schuer, Chuck Schuer? Wasn't that the guy's name at the Crystal Cathedral? The Crystal Cathedral is now Christ Cathedral. It's now a Catholic church. This Lonnie Frisbee is buried in there. And this actor, Jonathan Romy, went to his grave and lay, went to his place where he's at and laid out and sought to get revelation from him at his grave so he could play the part of him in the movie Jesus Revelation. That's called necromancy. That's reaching out to dead spirits trying to conjure up. Modern day new age word, we call it channeling, right? Now y'all tell me whether that's of God. Are you going to go there for the gospel? <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. I really am. I read you laughing with me, then staring me down with pitchforks and guys. <laughs> but now here's again, boy, I've gotten hit when I say anything about. I can stay pretty general. But if I say something specific like those things are not of God, I mean, and I'm talking about local people that we know. They come after me with knives. So much that my wife is mad at me. <laughs> and rightly so, I guess. She might be able to keep talking. She might. You're pushing. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. They, say, they come on there and they say, millions of people are being drawn to Jesus Christ through these things. Any man come on to you with a, another Jesus? Another spirit or another gospel. Paul says, I fear, lest as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, that ye also would be deceived from the simplicity that's in Christ. Millions of people are coming to Christ through these things. No, they're not. They're not coming to the Christ of this Bible. This thing. The Chosen plays on BYU, Brigham Young University TV. Well, that I'll tell you all you need to know about. Do you know that the Mormons believe that Jesus and Satan are brothers? The Mormons do not believe in the Trinity. They believe in, the, they believe in a unity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They do not believe in the Trinity, one God, and three personalities, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They don't believe that. They believe and teach that God, the, and they don't believe the Holy Spirit had anything to do with the birth of Christ, even though our Bible tells us that it was the Holy Spirit who came, <coughs> right? And she conceived. The, the, the Mormon church teaches that God the Father literally had a sexual relationship with Mary and produced Jesus. A literal, physical relationship. Not that she was conceived of the Holy Ghost. They said the Holy Ghost didn't have anything to do with it. That's what they teach. I can go on and on. I gotta quit. <laughs> I think I've made one more. <laughs> Folks, how do we start? Everything that calls itself Christian is not Christian. I don't care how sweet they are. I don't care how polite they are. Well, Brother Sam, they're about they're a whole lot nicer about it than you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care how sweet they are, how nice they are. I don't care if they talk about the death, burial, and resurrection. I don't care if they carry a Bible. I don't care if they're in church every Sunday. I don't care. I don't care how if they live good, godly, clean lives. You know, man, their life is cleaner than mine. You know. I mean, I don't care about all that if, because the devil will use that to pervert 
the gospel. And those who know and understand the truth of the gospel, we got to get grounded in that thing, get a hold of that thing, don't let go of that thing. We can't be among those who accept and tolerate all this other stuff. Because everything that calls itself Christian is not Christian. And I'm afraid we don't discern enough and pay close attention to what's being said. We hear similar phrases and we accept it because it sounds familiar. And, and here's another thing I say all the time, and I promise I'm shutting up. <laughs> Things that are different are not the same. It's not the similarities that show us they're wrong. It's the differences that show us they're wrong. Pay attention to that. Well, they got the death, burial, resurrection, but they add this. You got to do this. Right on down the line. I'm way, way, way past that. I appreciate you toler tolerating. And uh, you got two messages in one today. <laughs> and you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> it was cold out. We don't have anywhere to go. It's too cold to go to All right. Very good. I'm going to shut this thing down and then we'll wrap everything up. All right.